What happens when you adopt a dog? A dog who you fully expect to bring joy and light and connection to your family and to your life. Because that's why we love dogs so much, right? But only to find out that the dog you've adopted is so frightened of the world that all she can do is hide behind your sofa. Well, in this episode, in a departure from talking about separation anxiety, we're going to be talking about a dog just like that. And you might have heard of her. She's quite the Twitter star. Her name is Sophie. She's a Romanian rescue and she lives with Rory Keflin Jones and Diane Coyle. And I'm really excited because I'm getting to speak today to Simon Wooler. And Simon is the trainer who's been working with Rory and Diane and Sophie on building Sophie's confidence, on helping Sophie be less frightened of the world. Sai is a fellow Academy for Dog Trainers trainer. He's been working with dogs for 12 years, specializing in fear and aggression. So he has a lot to say about fearful dogs. And his goal with any dog and with Sophie is to help people, help guardians and owners feel confident and in control and enjoy the training and enjoy their dogs. He's got a wonderful story to tell about Sophie. So whether you've got a dog who's frightened of the world or frightened of people or frightened of anything, I think you're absolutely going to love what Sai has to say today. So tune in to find out more. Hello and welcome to the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. Hi, I'm Julie Naismith dog trainer, author, and full-on separation anxiety geek. I've helped thousands of dogs overcome separation anxiety with my books, my online programs, my trainer certification, and my separation anxiety training app. And this podcast is all about sharing my tips and tricks to help you teach your dog how to be happy at home alone too. So, size, thank you so much for your time today. So, we're talking about Sophie. Now, Sophie's story could be very familiar to lots of people in the UK, but for listeners around the world, can you tell us a bit about Sophie's backstory? Yes, I can tell you the backstory of Sophie. She was found in the street in Romania as a very young pup, and she was fostered, as we understand it, by a vet whose brother took her and kept her at a at his farm and she was homed with some other dogs and kept in the barn Mm -hmm. to all intents and purposes well looked after we suspect that not particularly socialized in that Mm -hmm. period so she kind of imprinted on the people that were at the house and the dogs that were uh, resident there but she didn't get a lot of contact as far as we can tell with unfamiliar people and unfamiliar dogs and so consequently when she arrived in the uk she came into the house she had to be carried into the house of rory and diane and she promptly hurtled behind the sofa and that's where she stayed for several days oh wow so rory and diane her new family in the uk Yes, Rory Kethlin Jones is the former technology correspondent for the BBC. And Diane Coyle is probably one of the most phenomenally intelligent people I've ever met. <laughs> um she's a she's a Cambridge professor of economics and a former chair of the BBC, or at least a, uh, the temporary chair of the BBC. Oh wow, wow. And all manner of other things, frankly, <laughs> author, as is Rory. So uh, she's landed in an intelligent home. Yeah. yeah. A but they didn't home. know. They didn't know they were getting. They they presumably thought they were getting uh, this adorable dog who would just be, you know, maybe have some settling in issues. But they weren't given any heads up that they were in for quite a challenge with her, right? No, they weren't. But in fairness, I think, like many people would do, the benchmark was how she was in Romania, mm. and that was, uh, to all intents and purposes friendly and excitable and interested and playful right and um and that didn't translate to going into a very unfamiliar environment with unfamiliar people after a three-day van ride you know so that 
those behaviors you're talking about the the, the the sociability and so on that was what she was demonstrating in that family in Romania so there was yeah some to in, a very in, to a very it. small circle of people you yes. know so yeah. ultimately I think that one of the you know the the interesting thing about being involved in Sophie with Sophie is that um you see you get an insight into what people think about dog behavior and mm. what they think about how to how to fix issues around dog behavior so the, the general kind of thing that people would normally be getting from their family and friend circle if you're working with somebody with a dog like Sophie and the stuff that you wouldn't normally see so you don't know that that input is happening um so this has been a really insightful experience because i can see that in real time i can i can see all of the good advice and suggestions that they get and and some of the less because everybody's Looking got an opinion, a... haven't they, when it comes to dogs? Everybody's everybody's an expert. Yeah, they have because everybody's got one and everybody's gone through an experience of some sort with them, you know, and um, and that informs how they see others. Yeah, yeah. So Sophie, like you, you just described, she spends three days in a van and transport and she arrives in the uk does she go straight to her new home or is there a, a transition period yes 3 a.m in the morning oh right <laughs> uh, yeah wow. 3 a.m in the morning was when the van landed and that's when rory went out and got her but uh, he literally had to carry her into the house right. and and I, I think in fairness she had a brief sojourn into the garden uh hid under the the patio table and then uh, headed straight back in uh and behind the sofa wow and so what did they make of that of her be of her doing that what did rory and diane oh, oh well I, I think they were bemused like mm. like a lot of people would be mm. you know and a little bit lost as yes. to how to how to confront it i think one of the things that you see what i did was it's all nina my partner's fault because she she uh, she was looking at the twitter feed and Rory and Diane had had a dog uh, that they loved very much called Cabbage, uh, who Rory used to tweet about a lot. And she died a year ago, roughly a year ago. And so they got Sophie with a mind that she would be she would help Rory uh, because he he is a very open sufferer of Parkinson's disease. So he uh, and he does a lot of work in that regard but it's important for him to get exercise and all of that sort of thing mm -hmm. so sophie was was his idea of a reason to get out and do some exercise and now this this poor little dog was behind the sofa you know and nina commented to me that she thought there was a curious curiously wide range of suggestions coming from people that might be quite confusing and this is on twitter and is it so people on twitter are diving yeah. into twitter fixing yeah. yeah okay got it yeah. yeah yeah no and so i i contacted rory and diane and said you know i gave them my credentials and i said if you need any advice you know get in touch i'm more than happy to have a chat which they did about mm -hmm. three and a half nanoseconds later <laughs> um and from there on i've been down there once didn't see a lot of her because that was pretty early days so i wasn't really expecting to but we've communicated over zoom we've communicated over whatsapp and messenger and any kind of platform that works for us under the circumstances and you know what actually you know i'm probably preempting a question here from you because you will know as as a separation anxiety expert that actually platforms like zoom and whatsapp and the like are incredibly useful in the work that we do with dogs with particularly dogs that have fear or anxiety related issues because the level of contact that we can have with people is huge yeah. and the, yeah. the intercession contact that we can have and i find that people use it if it's there and available and you just just do a little nudge they'll ask you a question or they'll tell you about something that's happened in their day or their week yeah. with their dog that they don't understand. And you can address it yeah. straight away yeah. instead of those things building up 
between sessions and then you've got only a, a limited time to um to deal with them so that's been an invaluable way of working i love it i love yeah. it and and also we're not then adding to the stress uh, we're not an additional stressor we're not there we're not adding to uh, the stress that a dog exactly. who is comfortable with strangers um exactly. so let's let's talk about that then so what were the biggest challenges that adorable little sophie was facing well you talked about the hiding just not being com- comfortable around the new family what else was going on well i think I mean, that's, essence, that's pretty major anyway but yeah but. I, I mean i would have to say i think in essence that's it yeah right? that's that's the big sale item yeah is that everything is stressing her out right. everything at this point everything is scaring her right and the difficulty is that be, because we're human, we all want that to resolve quite quickly yes. because, you know, we want the story that we had in our heads to come true. And, you know, I do that all the time. I'm I'm human. I do that with stuff. You know, I even do that with dogs. There have been times when, when I've been sit, sit, sitting there willing Sophie to come out, you know, yeah. just, just sitting at home willing it. But you know that it takes... It takes as long as it takes with fear um, yeah. cases. And what, what you're doing is a lot of the time is that you're just trying to help the people mm-hmm. maintain a degree of calm about the process and uh, reassure them that it is going the way it's supposed to because that feels like not much is happening. Yeah, yeah. And actually there is. Yeah. And, you know, some some dogs come in from a rescue situation and they're not like Sophie at all. They may have other issues. They may have no issues, but they're not necessarily. I mean, it's not uncommon for dogs to be to react the way Sophie did. And so can you describe what that looks like? Because if you've never had a dog who was like Sophie is, if you never had a dog shut down quite like Sophie did, you yeah. probably don't know what that looks like. Yes. It looks like a dog that doesn't emerge very often, mm. finds a safe place mm-hmm. where they feel confident that they are secure, and then they don't actually emerge very much. Right. So, and that's the challenge. And and in, in many ways, and when they do, they're extremely cautious. Right. So there's a tendency for them to scan a lot, come out very slowly, reverse very rapidly, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's a very slow process to get them out. And one of those, that's one of the really big lessons, that one of the big messages that I would give people Mm -hmm. that find themselves with dogs like Sophie is take it at their pace. Any effort to coax them out or persuade them out or change anything in the environment in order to try and accelerate that process is only actually going to make the thing go slower. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things about seeing what people are suggesting, there's a tendency to think of it in ter- because it's going slowly, to think of it in terms of not working. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so what you see is very well-meaning suggestions on what you could do instead. So have have you tried this? Have you tried that? Have you tried the other? Okay. And that that's working on a premise that there's a problem with the process that's yes. taking place now. But in fact, there isn't. It's doing what it's meant to do. It's working. Yeah. There and is I, no oh, need to change it. Oh, you know? I I so agree with you. And listeners who are used to tuning in to hear about separation anxiety will totally understand that because yes. many of them yeah. are working through desensitization and gradual exposure it's, it's a slow slow process a lot of change happens without us even spotting it and meanwhile everybody in their life is saying well that's not working that's not working so why don't you try this why don't you try that so i think it's comforting for people to know it doesn't just happen with dogs with separation anxiety it happens yeah, with yeah. a lot of these behaviors yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the hidey holes as well, because they all they can all find different spaces. So I've heard of dogs hiding under beds or picking a particular room. Did she have a a spot that she was really entrenched in? Oh yeah, she stuck to one sofa right. behind one sofa behind um, the sofa oh. behind it. Yeah, oh. 
she only changed that when there was a an event, an accident. A, a plate fell off the the arm of the sofa, oh. and it, she shut out and she picked another place for a short period of time, for a couple of days. She picked another place, oh. but she went back. Yeah, um, she went back, and and I think that is a a learning moment for people dealing with any kind of anxious dog, which is that they do choose. And actually this whole thing is about choices. Yes. This whole thing is about making, giving dogs choices about what they do and when they do it. And, you know, it's easy to imagine that she would be more comfortable in a crate or in a bed, but she hasn't decided that she's chosen something other than that. I mean, we, we decide that crates are, are for dogs, but yep. you know, unless the dog accepts it, then the, that's that's a bit academic yeah. and so the golden rule for me with well there are two golden rules i think which is one give the dog choice and respect that choice so everything you do is about is about looking to see whether they choose freely to do something or mm -hmm. not and when they do make sure that you make positive associations yes. with you and their environment and something that they already like yeah. But don't try and get them to move any further than they do. And I think that's that's really hard. You know, people, when a dog starts to emerge and starts looking a little braver, to coin a phrase, I mean, brave is funny. Rory and Diane raised an eyebrow when I said this to them uh, until I explained why. I said, I don't want Sophie to be brave. I want her to be fine. Yes. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um and because a lot of people are saying how brave she's being. Yeah. And I understand using the language sort of mm. at home, oh, my brave girl, and, yeah. and all that. I get that. You know, we all do that. But actually what you want in desensitization and counter-conditioning protocols is for the dog to be fine yeah. before you move on. Yes. Not having so to be brave, not not having to step just a little bit too far. Yeah, not having to white knuckle fine. it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so what that looks like is – she steps out and she stops and that's where you feed her. Yeah. That's where you make the association. You don't try and get her to take one more step by throwing the food by short it. or by, you know. And lo and behold, as she gets less fearful of the environment and of you, she gets closer and then she'll get closer and that's where Because what we had to do with Sophie was we had to do it in, in kind of the reverse to the way that you would ordinarily do a stranger danger protocol with a dog not you know i mean you know you would normally be able to have a familiar human there that the dog had a you know a, a safe association with and then you would introduce the stranger and the stranger would gradually get closer so i'm it, just going to stop you there side because i just want to uh, unpack that a little bit because yeah, a lot yeah. of people won't be familiar with that so but they will be familiar with separation anxiety training which is we always start with the easiest easiest possible setup whatever that looks like and then we gradually gradually increase the intensity as long That's as the right. dog's okay and as long as the dog's not telling us they're not comfortable and by the way i love the thing about choice because i'm often getting people say well, you know, the dog was barking and I was told not to come in because, you know, that's that's the worst thing you can do. Well, no, if your dog is telling you that they are so uncomfortable, they have to bark to get you to come back in, come back in because you need to give the dog control in this process. So yes. I love the choice thing. But yeah, you're right. So we we start with easy and we gradually increase the intensity. And as you're saying, normally with a dog who's fearful around people, they usually have people that they're OK with, usually the family is the yeah. familiar people that you start with, but not with Sophie, right? Right. And that's going to be true for anybody who takes on a rescue, isn't it? Yes. Who's, but that's, yes. That's, that's nervous about the situation that they find themselves right. in. And so now you've got to recognise and respect the safe space and treat and look for the signals from her about yeah. where she, where her boundaries are, where where her threshold is, where she feels safe. Yes. And that's the place where you start to engage her with something that she really likes. Yeah. And in, in Sophie's case, it's cheese and bacon. You know? <laughs> and you and are using food. So, you know, we don't use it for separation anxiety training. But no, true, you know, as true. I offer, yeah. as I say to people all the time, you know, this is, I'm a massive fan of using food for changing emotions. I mean, I've got one of those dogs that you and I were talking about that, you know, just isn't comfortable with anything. And I, I'm never without 
amazing stuff with him. And so you and I, our response when a dog isn't isn't happy with something is, okay, let's help it feel better with food, not coerce it into a behavior, but let's change that association from I don't like this to, oh, actually this predicts something quite good. So can you just tell us about that process of linking a previous thing with something that's amazing? Yes. I mean, what you do is essentially you pair something they already think is good. And usually it's something intrinsic. I mean, you can you can absolutely use something that they've been conditioned to feel good about. But cheese but and bacon is a good starter. <laughs> yeah. Food is the food is the easiest thing because yeah. it, you know it's the most potent thing and the thing that they usually adopt. Every dog has has its price, right? Every dog has his or her price. And so, you know, we probably don't want to get into the the thing about my dog's not motivated by food because every dog is, right? But anyway, so essentially what you do is it's Pavlovian. It's a Pavlovian response you're looking for. And in case anybody's not aware of the story of Pavlov's dogs, 19th century Russian uh, scientist chappy with a big beard who uh, lined dogs up in cages and they would ring a bell and two seconds later, food would be delivered to the dog. And they would repeat that over and over and over again until the point at which the dog salivated at the sound of the bell because they knew that the bell meant food. And so they were having an involuntary anticipatory response to the bell. So now you know that you've created a positive emotional response to the sound of a bell, right? By pairing it with chicken, whatever it is. And we oh, use and by the in... way, in separation anxiety training, sorry, I keep bringing it to separation anxiety training. No, 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 go on. But, go on. but we have the other way around. So often keys or shoes or coats have a conditioned negative oh. response, right? Because they say something bad is about to happen. So we see it to so just, just to give people some context, that's what's going on, just what Simon described, but reversed with dogs who are frightened of being left. So that thing can predict something good or something bad, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, the separation anxiety training is a, a really great example of how dogs can start to put sequences together, right? Yes. So they, they really learn the sequence that leads up. That's why people find it difficult to understand why a dog does something which apparently has no, you know, out of the blue, spontaneous. There was no reason for it. There's always a reason always for a reason. it. It's just that they've learned the sequence all the way back and to whatever haven't. it was, you know, yeah. But in the case of dealing with non-separation anxiety, fear-related stuff, you want to be making that Pavlovian connection. And so what you're looking for is an indication that they are anticipating that good thing yes and then you move just a little bit further forward towards your goal which in sophie's case is a walk up and take some food from your hand right we are there by the way hurrah oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> but the the point i want to make about that is and the thing that people find quite challenging is if you are saying every time that your dog sees a strange person you're going to give them chicken you must do it it doesn't matter what the dog does yes so even if the dog goes off like a banshee hooling around at the stranger you get out of dodge so you get the dog under threshold and in a place of safety Mm -hmm. and then you feed and everybody goes but you're reinforcing the bad behavior yes right and I say, it's not bad behavior. It's just behavior. Yeah. The difference between reinforcing bad behavior and paying for the presence of a stimulus are two different things. The point about it is that the, oh, I'm making lots of points, aren't I? Oh, I know. This is great. <laughs> the, but, yeah. The point about it is that the, the motivation for going off at the stranger is the fear. Yeah. It's the desire for the, for the stranger to depart. It isn't to get the chicken, right? Mm -hmm. If it were a behavior like sit down, stay, then the motivation is I'll do this in order to get that chicken. But this is different. This is an emotional response and you can't reinforce emotions. You can only change them. And the evidence is in the pudding. If that's the right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. We'll take that. Evidence is the Not the proof, the evidence. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because as that fear subsides, with that association, the behavior gets better or gets different, right? And the 
that can be really challenging for people because they they often feel like they need to be doing something and the dog needs to be doing something yes. and the dog needs to be so, doing something that isn't going off like a a, a banshee yeah um, and, and so i get that's asked really it all the time thing. oh sorry yeah <laughs> We could no, carry on. You're no, 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 go on. It's a chat. You go both on. both just so enthusiastic. But yeah. I keep I keep thinking of things. Oh, I must I must <laughs> remind people that that's what we say. So in separation anxiety, I always say to people, we don't care about behavior. We care about how the dog feels. So if, if your dog is wandering around or on a sofa or hanging out by the door because it knows, your dog knows you come back every few seconds, so it might as well wait. It, we don't care about the behavior. We care how your dog is, how your dog's uh, yes. emotional, about your dog's emotional state. So we, it's hard, though, I think, for people to give up on behavior because we spend a whole lot of time with dogs trying to reinforce behavior. But with fear and anxiety, trainers like you and I, anyway, we, we don't care about behavior. We care how the dog feels. Yes. The first consideration is, is the dog happy? Yeah. Right? Is the dog safe? Does the dog yeah. feel safe? Yes. The thing about counter conditioning is that you are you're not looking to get a behavior. You don't know what the behavior is going to be. All you're doing is pairing the good mm-hmm. thing with the bad thing. Yeah. The, what happens? The behavior that represents the fear disappears, but you don't know what's coming next. Yes. You, in terms of behavior, it is what it is. Right. And that yeah. could be sure. That could that absolutely could be something like begging under the table for food and it drives you nuts but you can fix that Mm -hmm. that's easy yeah that's easy you can change that anytime you want right and you can do it really pretty quickly but first of all you need to make make it so that the dog wants to be under the table yes Yes. begging for scraps yeah rather than hiding behind the sofa a much nicer problem to have that a dog a dog is actually seeking you out for food than is hiding behind the sofa from you yeah it's not really a problem, is it? No, 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 <laughs> no. Jumping up to give you kisses, no, compared to a dog who wants to bite your face off because he's so scared of you. Yeah, which yeah. one we take. And, of um, course, there therein lies a rub as well, that when people suddenly realise that actually aggressive behaviour is a fear response, yep. then they start to empathise more, understand more, and be more willing to look mm-hmm. at it in terms of, changing an emotion rather than imagining that the dog is out to do something yeah or, you know that, that this is a vindictive behavior yeah. which it really isn't because sophie was demonstrating more of the um flight or even freeze response to a threat wasn't she and you talked Absolutely. about your your rottweiler my labrinot techs they they are dogs and your dog was a dog who responds to fear and a threat by trying to get that threat to go away. So it's an aggressive response, but it's still about increasing distance from the threat. It's all about that. Yeah. Yeah. And Sophie's response to that is, I am going to make myself so small, I'm going to hide away, and then the threat will, won't even know I'm here. Bless her. Yes. And then and the really important thing is you've got to respect that space. Yes. Right? Yes. That that is that is absolute that's hallowed ground there for a dog. Yeah. You can't intrude in it on it you can't move it which is you know the tendency is to want to kind of make that space bigger or require her to come out of it or make it smaller so that she has to come out and and reduce her options all the time and that's absolutely not the thing that you want to be doing she needs more choice doesn't she not less so yeah um so we've got cheese and bacon in the mix let's yeah. let's talk about from the outset what things were you getting rory and dan to do with the cheese and the bacon so how was that uh, yeah what's the training training process look like yeah i mean it's it was untidy because it has to be i think because you're in a an environment where people have to carry on living their lives right and you can't do setups very easily or at least you can, but you have to be opportunistic about it. Right? A setup so, is just right. I'm going to do some training now, and I this yeah. is my goal. Yeah, yeah, right. So, and you could do that if you've got a dog that has a an attachment figure who makes them feel safe, who can feed them, mm-hmm. and you can just you can appear in and out of the space, and mm-hmm. and you can you know because order of events is is crucial in these things, right? So you have to 
you have to make sure that what you're not trying to do there's a oh there's a you know oh here i go going off on a tangent <laughs> but look there's a message i want to get across here and it's a it's a little bit of a tangent right which is that very often when people have reactive dogs and and i know sophie isn't but i just want to i, I want to say this because it's it may happen with dogs who are shy mm-hmm. that people try to distract them <laughs> from the problem so that the the person sees the problem first and starts feeding the dog before the dog is aware of the problem in order to try and distract them past or make it make them feel better about when the problem actually does appear yeah and the order of events is wrong in that because what you're doing you're running the risk of reversing that pairing process right now the food predicts the problem yeah so how do you feel about the food Every time I see cheese, a scary person comes yeah, around the corner. Scary person. So don't give me cheese. Yeah. Right? Don't give me cheese because if you give me cheese, I'm out of here. You know, right? Whereas what you want is scary thing. Oh, that must mean cheese. Excellent. Bring it on. Yeah. Okay. So distraction. No, please, anybody, don't distract your dog. Get them in a place where you've got control. By all means, if what you need to do once they've seen the the problem and you need to get out of dodge quickly and the best way to do that is feed them then fine but you've kept the order of events yeah. right so you're putting a little bit of emotional money in the bank in the emotional yeah. bank account which i that's the way i talk about this a lot you know about putting emotional bucks in the emotional bank account and so what it looked like with sophie was uh, very opportunistic because we couldn't predict when she was going to come out mm-hmm. so it, it got to the point where there were pots of treats and food everywhere okay and as soon as she appears something lands in front of her <laughs> of juicy delight lands in front of her and it was just a case of doing that and just rinsing and repeating all the time so getting them into a space where they're thinking about when they've got those opportunities, when they can take those opportunities, which is every time she rocks up, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And the predictor of the cheese was a person present. Was that what you were using yeah. as the predictor? Yeah. I mean, it's actually tricky because what's clearly happened with Sophie is that she started to feel better about the people before she started to, to feel better about the environment. Uh, yeah. Right? And so consequently, you would see st- stress indicators Mm. a lot and yet the behavior that you were getting seemed to contradict it okay so she might approach diane initially she did it first with diane you might approach diane for attention but demonstrate some sense of being stressed so conflict she was in kind of i like you but i'm hmm. yeah conflict absolutely so in early stages, I would say it was de- she was definitely conflicted. Mm. And later on, it was about that she wasn't really sure about the environment. And actually, Diane wasn't a stressor. She was a stress reliever. Right. Right? So it started to very much look like she was seeking out attention from Diane in order to get relief from stress about something external, something else. Right? And what we were getting when we were looking at the the social media threads were people getting very concerned about the stress signals that they were seeing in a 10 second video right. and so yeah. my message was there's a context to this mm. and you know that there's more to this than the 10 second video that you're seeing so it's quite important to and but what i really want to do is i want to inform people of that so it's not about saying you're wrong you know mm-hmm. stop commenting on this thread it's about having a conversation and explaining why the the preconception there's something else going on other than that you know and that makes yeah. me think of something that that gets leveled at those of us who work with fearful dogs using food using things that the dog might like and this this makes my blood boil so but i'm going to say it that we're coerce <laughs> we're coercing the dog now i if anybody accuses 
a trainer who's using an association of co coercing a dog, first of all, I'd say go look up the dictionary definition of coercion. And then also, if we're working with a dog and using food to make them do something that they really don't want to do when they are petrified, when they are scared, when they are feeling threatened, well, that's not what we're doing. And I no. I, I, I always think um, Jean Donaldson thinks she would say, well, that's just lousy training. <laughs> that's not that's not yeah. the method. That's just bad training. If you can't yeah, spot that, a dog I was that's going to quote her too. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't spot a dog who's over threshold because you've lured it into a situation, then that's just bad training. That's not yes. um, you know, that's not casting aspersions on the methods that we use. I'm not saying that you and I are perfect trainers, but we're as our goal is always to go at the dog's pace and make it the dog's choice. So how can it be coercion if it's the dog's choice? Yes, because in order to to be accused of co accused in vertical commas of mm -hmm. coercing the dog, the dog has to be aware that the food is present, and so they are they are conflicted about whether they overstep their safety boundary mm. to get to the food or not yeah but if you're if you're doing the protocol correctly the dog does the thing or you do the thing before the food is present before the dog knows that the food is coming the dog anticipates the food sure because something has happened that usually predicts it yeah but you haven't said here's the food if you come two steps further forward, you can have it. That's not what you're saying. You're saying you've come two steps further forward. Therefore, there's going to be food. Not you can have the food. Yeah. Not I decide whether you can have the food. You are going to get the food. Yeah. Because it there is a reliable predictor there. And it's been that's been done by way of classical condition, of Pavlovian yeah. conditioning. It's involuntary, right? So how is it it can't possibly be coercive? Only if, if you, you do, do it, it wrong. right. Only if you do exactly. If you, yeah, yeah, if you do it right. Yeah. Okay. Now, the thing I would say about that is that if dog guardians or owners or whatever you refer to them as get that wrong, it's not their fault. No. Right? They haven't done two years of a, de of a, a degree equivalent certification program and got a qualification and they don't understand all of the nuance of classical conditioning so my job is to steer them towards those and pick pick the most important things that they are because you're not going to teach them all of it yeah you know so pick what's important and for me what was important and always is is order of events yeah order of events and that's right. probably something you drummed into Rory and Diane, isn't it? Or yes, yes. Endlessly, <laughs> yes. Sometimes I'd wake them up with a phone call. At, no, no, I didn't. Um, <laughs> but yes, that's my big message. That was my my number one was that. My, my number two would be to try and help them identify and recognize when they are trying to persuade rather mm -hmm. than just just grabbing the the event as it happens yeah yeah and and so this has all been working really rather well for sophie hasn't it because i think you mentioned that she what maybe your first goal was that she would take food from either diane or roy's hand so you got there though you got to yes that, got there with milestone. both of them yes she now really? does little um she now does little uh seek and destroy missions into the <laughs> into the dining room whenever they're sitting at the table because now the table you know sitting at the table means good stuff so does breakfast actually interestingly enough Great. um i have to say all of the photographs that i've seen of breakfast time in that household i want breakfast there <laughs> every morning um, so the um yes so she now has this little ritual that she does several times a day where she does these li does little circuits of the of the dining room and then heads under the table to get something tasty and then potters either goes into the garden or heads back to what is now frankly a place of comfort mm -hmm. and safety right yeah but essentially comfort now essentially her chosen den yeah so what i oh, what i tried to do this was an interesting thing what i tried to do is identify things that might be those positive association 
ingredients if you like mm-hmm. right? yeah so there isn't sometimes the food isn't going to work as much as there is another competing motivator in play that at that time is going to work better for you right and in sophie's case there was one that that stood out and this was about still making rory the good thing in the world Mm -hmm. right we got diane diane was rocking it okay and it's not rory's fault and we'll actually get to another myth to bust in a second if we've got time about why why dogs are more fearful of men than they are of women right but we weren't there yet with rory and she was still really quite timid about even just stepping out when rory was there so what we figured was she loves the garden absolutely loves the garden you'll have seen it on twitter loves it so what we did was we set up a, a a system whereby that if she was out and about rory would stand up uh, go to the door say garden and then open the door and and she would go out of the door right so the the aim was that she would start to learn that rory standing up and moving mm-hmm. towards the door and then saying garden so garden means the door's going to open and rory's the one that opens the door yes so he's the deliverer of good things exactly right so in a sense what i'm saying is to people at home food's your real food's your primary motivator i mean there's no two ways about it you know in uh, yeah. that's your big hitter but there are other things in the environment there are always other things that you might be able to use to establish those positive associations and put a little bit more emotional money in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Just even a little bit, even a little bit counts. And of course, the other thing that's important for me, the one of my jobs is to point out to people how much progress they're making. Yes. Cause she's made a lot of progress. I mean, she's not been there. Is it two months now or coming up for three Uh, months? She's in week nine. Week nine, yes, yeah, so just over two months, yeah. yeah. And so she's made, I know to a lot of people it doesn't sound like she might have made a ton of progress. I think to anybody who's had a dog like Sophie or worked with a dog like Sophie, you'll understand how massive it is. I think also people who've got a dog with separation anxiety will understand how massive yeah. it is. I know there's no crystal ball and we never say your dog will be fine in X months, X weeks. <laughs> so, but, but I'm going to put a but in here and give you a really difficult question <laughs> today. But what's your, what's your sense? What's your sense for Sophie's progress? Do you see a, a brighter future for her if um, Rory and Diane continue this? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, there is no absolute. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no absolute in any dog training, but there certainly isn't any absolute in, in fear-related work. Yes. You can't categorically say that the dog is going to stop being fearful of something or some things or to any to any degree you can say you're going to get some of the way down the road you might even get all of the way down the road but some of the way down the road is better than none of the way down the road yeah yeah but she's going great guns and if we can get a get a confidently approaching diane and rory then the next step is to get her into a harness and then the mm. next step is to get her out into onto a walk, and that that we are ready to do when yeah. as soon as she is right, as soon as she. Because here's a couple of things I just want to say in terms of myth busting. Couple of couple of things about fear that are myths, and I want to bust them. So the first is that if a fearful dog is frightened of men, they must have been abused by men yeah, in that their all the past, time, right? This is not necessarily, it could be true, but it's not necessarily true. There are a number of ways that fear can be created, for want of a better word. It's created, yeah, go on. Mm. So certainly trauma and ill treatment can be one of them, but equally they could have a genetic predisposition to anxiety and all kinds of things can happen in the very early weeks of life with a puppy that might result in yeah. uh, in fear. Uh, uh, things can happen to the mum while she's pregnant that might result in a litter being fearful. But there is also lack of socialisation, which 
uh, as we've said you know just because they imprinted on some individuals early in life that doesn't mean to say that they're going to naturally find it easy to adjust to others so there are all kinds of reasons why dogs might be fearful of men particularly given that the statistical probability is that they're going to be if they're fearful of people they're going to be more fearful of men than women right all kinds of really fascinating studies by the way and another time we might talk about yeah. them because they're they're wacky they're oh really wow great. interesting about yeah yeah about i i saw something the other day about um how they're using AI, you know, the sensors that they use for for things like the Avatar film yeah. to identify how people walk. And they think mm. that that dogs might, might be interpreting the walk of people differently. So women walk in a way that looks as if they're going away from the dog and men look as if they're moving faster towards them. And we Funny. know that approach is a challenging thing yes. when it comes to fear. Now, how true yeah. that is and whether or not they can stack yeah. that one up I don't know, but it was an interesting read. Where were we? Yeah, so um, we were talking. At, yeah, you 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 had two oh, fears. One more. Yeah, 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 yeah. One more, right? And then I'll shut up. Go no, go um, for it. The uh, why don't you throw another dog in the mix? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't you introduce her to another dog? She'll love it. That'll help her. The, the other dog will teach her to not be afraid of yes. people. Right? I get it. Or I teach them it. home alone confidence side. Yes. Is the other one, obviously, yes. I hear all the time. Right. So just the same as as the fact that in separation anxiety, introducing other dogs, having company from dogs doesn't fix it. Mm -hmm. The same is true of fear towards people. The other dog doesn't fix it. Right. Yeah. What you do get, you. I mean, you could you could make a case if the dog really, and I have done it. You could make a case for if the dog really likes other dogs you can use the other dog as as the associate uh, i'm trying to yeah. avoid using jargon here no um, so the you, other you, good thing you were talking the about other good you know thing. rory predicting the, the garden or diane predicting chicken but the other it. dog could be that's the it. thing that, the yeah. other dog could be the, be the thing the cheese yes right? the other dog could be the cheese if what you do is you they see the person first and then they see their pal yeah. dog right you yeah. could do that it's feasible what it doesn't do is if you just introduce the dog to play then that's great they have this good time and they they get some stress relief and they enjoy themselves but when you take the dog away that hasn't advanced yeah that right it hasn't advanced your cause in terms of people yeah so it, you go back to where you were in that and you still have to do the work the other thing about it is that you may have a dog that doesn't like other dogs <laughs> right. so the, the consequences of just introducing another dog into that environment which they already are nervous about yeah with people that they are already nervous about and now you've put something in they're scared of yeah now you've got a problem right yeah you just so added to it the, yeah the the thing although it's a well-intentioned suggestion my my position is i want her absolutely rock solid safe about the people and about the environment that she's in before we introduce anything else and then we're going to do that in a really measured and controlled way we're going to test whether she is good with dogs or not yes because because she may not be yeah. she hasn't had a lot of contact with them she's got the dogs that she was in the barn with and i don't know how many that was not that it matters but i don't know how many it was and i don't know how many strange dogs unfamiliar dogs she was introduced to while she was there i have no idea of that and those and dogs in the barn are different dogs i mean i i say that a lot to people because occasionally occasionally we do see another dog helping one i don't know if it's helping but we see the introduction of a dog into a household whether that's you know parents dog comes to stay for the weekend and you know the the the, the anxious dog the dog that can't be left seems much better yeah, but you know that I always say, but that could just be that dog, you know. And unless you want to borrow your mum's dog, you know, seven days a week, then it's a risk to assume that another dog is going to. So, so on the rare occasions, it seems to make a difference. It also can be very dog dependent. As in, I think it makes a difference the other while dog the matters. dog's there. Yeah, right. It makes a difference while the dog's there. But when you remove the dog, you don't see them at that level. Yeah. Stay at that level, right? Yeah. So in a, in a sense, the same way as 
uh, that if you give a, a dog that you're leaving who has sepanks a Kong before you leave, right? The measure of how measure of how long they are okay for starts when they finish the Kong. Yes. Not yeah. right. So yeah. same principle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is such a great story. I don't know. We could probably chat for another hour about <laughs> it. Um, but I did just want to close with. I'm going to put you on the spot here and say, if you had two tips. Two. I'm going to give you two <laughs> to give to people who think they've got a dog like Sophie. What are those two tips? The first tip is go at their pace, mm -hmm. right? Take your time, give them uh, every opportunity to make good choices and actually the good choice is the right one for them. So yeah. what, whatever that is, that's the first one. And the second one you will not be surprised by is that if you're struggling if you're finding it difficult, if you don't understand the behavior, if it's bemusing to you, go find a really good pro yeah. to help you. Yep. And I know that lots of people like you who really understand this topic, yes, sometimes people can't afford to hire a one-to-one -one trainer, but people are offering online classes now. They're offering fantastic resources online. So it's just about finding the right stuff. And by the way, if anybody in my uh, my listener group wants to know where the right stuff is, you know, always just get in touch and we'll make sure you get the right info. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, my my email is easy. It's on my website, uh, which is currently, there is a website up, but uh, there's a new one being built. So, um, Well, I was going to say, we'll, we will link to, to a few things in the show notes, Si. So uh, where can people follow Sophie's ongoing story? Is Twitter the best place for that? Yeah, Twitter, I think, is the main place. So we'll she link has, to that. She has an Instagram account. <laughs> uh, well, she doesn't. Rory has. Of course. There's a lot of uh, pressure on for Sophie to have her own Instagram account. <laughs> I can understand that. I, I'm, I'm kind of with them on that one. Yeah, so they can find find her on Twitter. Hang on. Yeah, let no, me just... that's fine. I will. I will. Oh, you can find it, notes. can't you? Yes. Yeah. So you can find Rory's. Uh, I think he's Ruskin 147 or yeah. something like that. I'll pop that uh, on. The and if anybody you know, is out there really struggling, can't find a trainer or uh, needs some help in finding one, then I, my email. Well, um, I'll pop that in the number, show notes as well. Are yeah. you sure we get thousands of listeners? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, uh, if I get a lot, then I will, you know, I will go through them and I will respond. It just might take a while Amazing. for me to do that. My phone number's on there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the <laughs> we're getting 3 a.m whatsapps from people yeah. in los yeah. angeles so <laughs> yeah well i love whatsapp it's great i know Fantastic. what do we do without um, it what else can i yeah so and and i will at least point them at a list of people that perfect that might what i can't sometimes do though is i can't say for sure whether any how good anybody is i i can't recommend unless i know them personally yeah yeah that, no and i'm the same all i can I'm... say is they've got the right credentials i'm the same i'm the to same to help so yeah. i'm more than happy to do that well what a brilliant conversation i loved it because i love that we've talked about sophie sophie's journey but we've also talked about how to help dogs overcome fear which i think is going to be really helpful for a lot of people who have a Sophie or a dog like Sophie or a dog who's just fearful, just fearful. Yeah. And also we've managed to link it into separation anxiety, which is the geek separation anxiety geek in me always manages to do in most cases. How clever are we? <laughs> and you managed to get a word in edgeways, didn't you? Just about, just about. <laughs> but listen, thank you so much for your time today. And I You're think we'll welcome. all be watching uh, to see Sophie's progress and we are all rooting for her. So thanks so much, Si. You're very welcome. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Be Right Back Separation Anxiety Podcast. If you want to find out more about how I can help you further, head over to julienaismith.com. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed listening today, I would love it if you would head over to wherever you listen to your podcast and consider rating my show. Thanks so much. Good luck with that training and bye for now.